Good morning, brothers and sisters, and special welcome and greeting to all guests and visitors worshiping with us on this Lord's Day. The Council has the following announcements. Consistory hopes to meet the Lord willing on Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. in the church building. Also, a special service will be held at, Cure, uh, at uh, Shepherd's Care this evening at 7 o'clock p.m. And our offerings today are collected for MRF for Middle East Reformed Fellowship. So far, the announcements. Let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Receive now the Lord's greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise our God together by singing from Psalm 33, stanzas 1 and 4. Once again, submit our lives to the reading of God's holy covenant law, the Ten Commandments, which are a true, faithful, and reliable summary of the character and of the will of our God, which is also what we are called to live by, by the power of God's grace and spirit. So let us read God's law this morning as we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5, and after hearing the law, let us sing together in response from Psalm 19, stanza 6. And God said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those 
who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when asked which is the greatest commandment in the law, he replied answering by summarizing, summarizing God's law by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us now bow our hearts before God in prayer. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, as we worship you on this Lord's Day, we stand aware that you are a God of perfect purity, a God who is awesome in your beauty and holy in your majesty. For you dwell in unapproachable light. You are seated on your glorious throne in heaven where you are worshipped by all the holy angels numbering thousand upon thousand, ten thousand upon ten thousand praising your great name singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Father, you dwell in heavenly perfection but we dwell on earth. We live in a world 
of defilement, of uncleanness, of sin and depravity. Father, there is so much sin and brokenness in this world. And we confess that there is so much sin and brokenness in our own lives also. For none of us can point to our clean record, our own perfection, for we have none. We know that our records are not clean, are not free of guilt and of spot and of blemish. Father, how polluted our lives really are because of sin. Even in our best works, they too are overshadowed by sin. Lord, we are stained, each one of us, by the reality of our sins that are present in our hearts. We confess, after hearing your law, of the greed, of the evil desires, of the coveting, of our own wishes and wants that exists in us. And we admit, Heavenly Father, that we often harbor malice and wickedness in our hearts. We are not always completely trustworthy and true and transparent before you and before others. We believe lies about the truth. And we speak lies to hide the truth. We distort the truth or we twist it to our own advantage. We sometimes even lie to cover up guilt and wrongdoing. And even more, we fall prey to the culture's lies about the pursuit of material things or about sexual satisfaction as what will produce true happiness and joy. And so often we give in to sin We cave to temptation without fighting against the inclinations of our sinful will and sinful nature. In realizing who we are, O Lord, we confess our guilt and shame before You. For by nature our hearts are wickedly depraved. We are rebellious. We don't want to submit to You. We don't want to surrender to Your will at the sake of our own will. And sometimes we show that We do not want to submit to your will by not submitting to our fathers and mothers. We don't want to do what they tell us or to listen to their guidance and teaching. And we don't want to follow their godly example. And sometimes we do not have respect for the authorities whom Christ has set up in this world and in the church to be over us. And Lord God, we could hear your holy commandments once again this morning and we acknowledge that as your redeemed people who have received so much blessing in Christ Jesus, we are still in need of cleansing. We are still in need of forgiveness. And so we pray once again today for the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his powerful atoning work on the cross, which makes us clean. We thank you that in his blood we may be washed fully from the guilt and the power and the pollution of sin. And so we pray this morning, O God, that you will look upon us as your people who are united to Christ through his death and resurrection by faith. And because of that we pray that you will accept us not because of who we are in ourselves, but because of the righteousness, holiness, and innocence of Christ that is ours by faith. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to be gathered here for worship. And we pray for your blessing upon us. We pray for your blessing upon the singing, upon the offerings that will be brought to you, upon of Holy Scripture and upon the preaching that we hear. We pray may it all serve to magnify your great and awesome name. And may we all receive it eagerly and wholeheartedly so that we may grow in the knowledge of your Son and be built up in our faith and trust in him. Hear us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. As we prepare to open and read from God's Word, let us sing together from Psalm 128, stanza 1.
I invite you now to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We'll read this morning from the first chapter of God's revelation in the book of Hebrews. Our text is found in the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 2, which follows immediately upon uh, on the heels of Hebrews 1, which we will read together now, the full chapter. Hear now God's holy and inspired word that we find in Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens, and uh, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Here begins our text we must pay the more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So far, our reading of the text this morning, as well as the reading of God's word, May he bless it to our hearts. In response to the proclamation of God's word, we will sing from hymn 55, all the stanzas of hymn 55. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, when, whenever someone walks away from the faith, it always creates a ripple effect throughout the church. Ripples of shock and and emotions. And we sometimes wonder why we did not see the, the warning signs sooner on. Or maybe we think back and, and through hindsight we flag certain alarming signals or trends 
which we may have witnessed earlier but never thought would, would materialize into anything more. Maybe we found ourselves thinking thoughts like, they'll snap out of it eventually. They've just temporarily lost their way, but, but they'll find it back. But they didn't. And now they're only further along down the road that they were traveling. And we've all seen this happen. And it hits closer to home, to some than to others, to be sure. And, and yet that always seems to blindside us. We're tempted to say at times like these, how could this happen? What went wrong here? Those sorts of things. And that's where the text that we read this morning comes in. Our text alerts us to pay more careful attention lest we go the same route, lest we backslide, lest we grow apostate and turn away from the Lord and and He also from us. And this is a warning that we all must hear. For no one is immune from drifting. We must therefore pay more careful attention to use the opening words of our text. And so the Word of God comes to you this morning as summarized under this theme, keep from drifting by being anchored in Christ. And we will see two points under this theme. And the two points are first, the danger of drifting, and secondly, the corrective to drifting. First, the danger of drifting. Secondly, the corrective to drifting. First, we see the danger. Well, before we dig deeper into our text, it's good again to refresh ourselves about the background uh, to the book of Hebrews. The book, though he is unidentified, was writing to a church community, perhaps a small one, made up of Hebrew Christians. Hebrew Christians who were suffering great pressure to go back to their former ways, their former Jewish ways. The challenge these newly converted Christians were facing was to abandon the way of trusting in and following Jesus Christ, to go back to the way of the law. These Christians would in all likelihood have had family and and friends surrounding them who who had not been converted like them who were saying things like, "What, what have you done? Turn around. Come back. Come back to to your Jewish ways without Jesus. Forget about this stuff. Put it away. Don't go away from this great system that we have to what you have now. And you can imagine the pressure that they were under. Now you'll notice that the author never anywhere even gives the slightest impression that the law was obsolete, no longer necessary, something to do away with. He never disputes the greatness of what God had given in the law centuries before. He never downgrades the law because he knew its truth and its relevance as a faithful and reliable summary of the character and will of our God. It was a a spectacular thing, a great and glorious thing, the law. And it is not something that we should ever toss aside today, even though many churches today have, have chosen to do that. It doesn't factor in to their worship their service very much. And yet, the Hebrew Christians for whom this letter was written were being told to dump Christ, to forsake Christ for the sake of the law. But just like the law should not be undervalued, neither should it be overvalued. For we, if we undervalue the law, then we will also undervalue the death of Jesus Christ. But if we overvalue the law so that we think that it is all that is necessary, then we've surrendered the gospel of grace 
for, the, for a false gospel of thinking that we can be saved by our works. In either case, by undervaluing the law or by overvaluing the law, we are failing to see our need for Christ. This failure to see the greatness of Christ is what the author refers to in our text as drifting. Now, drifting here does not have the sense of, of drifting pleasantly down the river in a, in a boat or on an inner tube. Or, nor is our text giving the impression that someone commandeering a boat is deliberately and suicidally steering toward the rocks in order to ram into the shore. But the idea here has to do with not paying attention and subtly and quietly turning, turning, turning by the force of the the current underneath you, carrying you, so that before you know it, you're, you're going in the wrong direction, lost in wrong waters. Drifting happens gradually. And he can, can go un, undetected even by those on board the vessel. And we can see the effect of drifting in some of the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. What was said to the church at Ephesus? These words. You have forsaken your first love. That's something that happens almost unnoticeably. It was not as though the Ephesian church one day woke up and and rejected the gospel. They first stopped loving it. And then to the church of Laodicea, what was said to them? You are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. They had not grown, they had not gone stone cold. Neither were they inflamed with zeal as they had been before. They had drifted. And they were headed towards destruction, drifting like a piece of driftwood down the Niagara River. The problem that we as God's people face today is much the same. We do not, as of yet, by God's grace, fear a a frontal attack with guns aimed at our faces or at the faces of our loved ones demanding that we renounce our confession in Jesus Christ. That's not what we face yet to this point. Today, our, our danger is to drift, to ignore such a great salvation. It doesn't matter how good of a beginning we had. It doesn't matter if we were doing well earlier at some point in a former stage of life, none of that matters if you do not continue steadfastly to the end. This is a serious matter as verses 2 and 3 bring out. There it says, For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? The text there is making a a comparison between the punishments handed out against those who disobeyed in the Old Covenant era to the punishment that awaits those who disobey in the New Covenant era in which we live. Already in the Old Covenant, disobedience against God brought swift judgment as we know in the case of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, who rebelled against Moses and Aaron. The ground swallowed them up. Or in the case of Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, whose whose greed got the worst of him, he was immediately inflicted with leprosy. Or we can think of the exile into captivity for the nation of Israel after the people of Israel refused again and again to listen to the prophets and to turn from their unbelieving ways. God brought severe judgment 
and punishment upon them for rejecting his gifts, his gifts like the law, his, his words of promise to them, the holy institutions he had given them of temple worship and Sabbath day rest. If he was severe to them, how much more severe will he be towards those who reject his greatest gift of all, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, his own beloved son? The greater the privilege, the greater the punishment. The author of Hebrews reminds his readers that they had heard of such a great salvation so that they cannot afford to make the mistake of ignoring it. Now why was it so great? Why, what was so great about this salvation? Well, first, because it is a word from God from God, spoken, as it says in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, in these last days. Now, that wasn't simply a time marker, but the phrase last days, scripturally understood, are the days in which you and I find ourselves to be living in, between the time of Christ's first coming and his coming again at the end of the age. These are the last days we are living in. And so do not neglect such a great salvation that has been revealed in this last hour, so to speak. Further, this salvation is great because it is centered upon Christ, the fulfillment of everything that came before. Throughout the first chapter, throughout much of it, the, the writer goes on to great lengths to show from the Old Testament scriptures that Christ, when contrasted with the angels, far surpasses them and is infinitely superior to them in greatness and majesty and glory. Christ is, he says, the radiance of God's glory. He does not just reflect the glory of God. He is God. Himself, the second person of the Trinity. Not a mere ambassador who brings the word of another, but he has brought us his word, his own word. And so what we, what we do with that word is so incredibly important. It's not just the word of the preacher so that you can go home you can dismiss it. You can say that sermon blew all four tires that couldn't get anything out of it. Nothing in it for me. Or I didn't like that one little part, so I, I can excuse myself and dismiss the rest. If you've ever heard anything like that, what those comments fail to keep in mind is that God has given you His Word. Christ has given you His Word through the preacher. He could have chosen not to use a preacher at all. He could have used a stone. He could have used a donkey. He could have done it without a preacher altogether and said, here's my word for you. You, need, you should need no help with this. But that's not what he did, of course. He has sent his servants to minister his word to us and to teach us. And so who are we? Who are we to set it aside, casually dismiss it? In light of this great salvation, the Hebrew Christians were in danger of turning, of quitting with it, of going backwards to their old ways, of abandoning the church for the synagogue. They were in danger of drifting from the gospel. And so that begs the question for us, how might we be in danger of drifting from the gospel? Well, it could be by becoming too busy. We're thinking about our summer plans, our summer vacations. Got to get everything ready. Got to get everything packed. Summer's too short. Got to do this. Got to do this and this. Yet, where did the time go? And uh, we're on our way. Oh yeah, forgot to pack my Bible again. Shrug the shoulders. Oh wow, 
with so much to do, we neglect our Bible reading, we neglect prayer, we neglect church, we neglect thinking about spiritual matters. It all gets met with indifference and an attitude of ambivalence. That's drifting. But we can drift from the gospel also by becoming overly sophisticated, getting trapped in debates over issues that, that should not serve, uh, uh, that do not deserve more than a second of our time. And what is so disheartening about overhearing a, a vain squabble where voices are getting raised and, and the blood pressure is rising, as you can see, is that it, it never seems to be about the gospel. But it's so often about some insignificant footnote to the gospel. But it can work the other way, too. For it's possible to think too highly of the intellect that God has given you so that you start to question if the Bible is really so special anymore. It's just a human book. And the, and the commandments are more like advice, you know. And this is an old book. Is it really relevant for today, for me? You know, that's the start of drifting. And drifting can also happen when a church becomes mechanical, going through the same old routines without paying any thought or attention towards it, to what we do and why we do it. It's just something that you do. Something to fill your Sunday for a little while. Join heartily in the singing. No, I can't be bothered. Listen closely to the preaching as if I cannot afford to miss even a word, if at all possible. No, I can't be bothered to do that either. It's good enough that I'm here in person, right? Or what about remembering to bring some money for the offering to contribute to the collection? No, I'm too much at the center of my own world to, to give a rip about anyone else sharing in the joy of the gospel. I'm just going to pass the bag along. That's drifting. It's drifting whenever important things are pushed into the background. And we give no thought to the things of God. God is nowhere on our radar. And like a weed, it starts out small, and this indifference grows. And it gains momentum until it becomes too hard to hide. And it starts to show itself through falling asleep in the worship service having the ability to talk and talk and talk until it becomes about spiritual things. And you can see it. You can see it also in avoiding involvement in the fellowship of the congregation and keeping oneself at, at arm's length from others, from the brothers and sisters in the Lord who are there to give admonition and to give encouragement to you. There's an evident disconnect there. Signs that one really doesn't love God or His Word or His people. Those are signs of growing cold toward God. What's on the inside appearing also on the outside. And it doesn't remain that way forever. Eventually this indifference morphs into half-heartedness until the, the heart grows cold and hard and, and you refuse to continue to live with this tension in your life of a divided heart and a divided mind until finally you, you walk away saying something like, I don't know why I bother with this church stuff anyways. It all means nothing to me anyways. So how do we combat this. Well, that brings us to our second point, looking at the corrective to drifting. 
The corrective to drifting is given in the very first words of our text. Pay the more closer attention to what you have heard, lest you drift away. This may remind us of the words Paul spoke to the Corinthians in Corinthians 10 verse 12 when he said, If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Not one of us is not vulnerable or susceptible. Not one of us could do without this warning in God's word. For as long as you're breathing, you remain a sinner. And as long as you're a sinner, you're susceptible to having a wandering heart. What about all the warnings in the Bible if this wasn't true? What about the book of Hebrews filled with its many warnings? If this wasn't true of us, then, then we should all tear out this book out of our Bibles. And I, I mean, right now. We don't need it. No point keeping it if we don't need it. Of course we need this book. And we need the warnings it gives and we need God to impress it upon our hearts by His grace so that we do not drift away. So we must pay more careful attention. How, how do we do that? Well, we must think this through for ourselves, adopting strategies to help us pay better attention. That means things like getting to bed in due time on Saturday night. Perhaps you'll think to take notes on Sunday. Perhaps you'll wish to listen to the sermon recording on YouTube afterwards, once over, to refresh your memory, to refresh your mind. Is the technology is there to do that. Videos are there. Whatever helps us to cement the understanding of God's Word. Whatever helps to keep your focus. This we must do so that you do not drift. We must anchor down all that we can. For whatever is not anchored down will be taken out by the tide. It's not that you need to do something in order for things to start slipping away, but it happens by not doing something for things to slip away. It works this way also in many relationships with your wife, with your children, or relationships in the church. Relationships need tending to. Maybe we've learned this truth the hard way through failure sometimes. But you will tend a relationship if it's important and if it's valuable to you. It's rare, very rare, for you to decide suddenly out of the blue one day to to get rid of a friend by cutting them loose. More commonly, it happens that you just neglect them. Isn't that right? You've, You've moved on or moved away and you just don't keep the connection alive as it was in past days, and without contact, you just drift apart. Not because you've rejected each other, but you just don't spend time together with each other in person or or via phone or email. In other words, if you want to maintain the relationship, you need to take the effort to do so. But when it comes to our most important relationship with God, We should take every precaution to avoid moving on. For that relationship must be maintained consciously throughout each day and also through the summer days, also on our vacations, so that we do not drift apart. We must therefore be active and intentional in where we are steering our hearts. You can compare it to driving Say you're on your family trip through the mountains and your, and your car, your vehicle, begins to shake uncontrollably and, and you don't know what's going to happen next. Before you is a, is a cliff. Before you is an oncoming 18-wheeler. What you're not going to, to be doing at that point is, is adjusting the radio, looking in the mirror, answering your phone, 
You have family with you in the vehicle. Your most precious cargo there with you. And, you're, and so you're gripping the wheel with total focus and intentionality because you don't want to crash or go over the cliff. And so all your attention is on steering to safety because of the peril right before you. That's the intensity of the, uh, that the author is trying to bring out here. Do not neglect the gospel. Grip it with the, with the tightest white-knuckled grip you have. Like there's nothing else like it, for there isn't anything like it. Don't let it go, but hold on to it. Like your life depends on it, because it does. Because it does. Steer your heart in the course of faithfulness to Christ. And an implication of this is that, an implication of our text is that it's not enough to hear or to read the Bible, but we must delight in the truth of the Bible as we heard a a few Sundays ago when we looked at Psalm 1. In our devotions, it's too easy We too easily swish it around in our mouth like it's mouthwash. Oh yeah, Psalm 18. Oh yeah, 1 Corinthians 4. Swish, swish. Spit out the door, off to work, turn on the radio. What did you read earlier today? I don't know. Wears off that quickly. And so there needs to be an intentionality of drinking in the gospel, of savoring it, of enjoying it. Like sitting down, if you're a man, and eating a a big, giant piece of steak, prime cut of meat, tender and juicy, a feast for the eyes, a feast for the mouth and the stomach, fork and knife in hand. It's a moment of great enjoyment, great excitement tasting that delicious food, every bite better than the next, maybe coupled with some grunting and groaning. That's, that's delighting in the Word. And you could compare that to a young child who's fed a plate full of raw vegetables. You know how it goes. The child looks at it, plays with it a little bit. Am I done yet? They try to hide some away by sneaking it away, putting it in their pockets, doing anything they can do to not eat it. That's not delighting in the Word of God. Delighting in the Word means that we must read it and we know this is good. And we want to talk about it and enjoy it and delight in it. Brothers and sisters, our text this morning wants to remind us of, of the treasure that God has given to us in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of us have given up a great deal to hang on to that Gospel so that it does not slip through our fingers or through the fingers of our children or of our grandchildren. That's what it means to not ignore such a great salvation. Well, as you know, there are some things in life that you can neglect and and it won't make much of a difference. Perhaps you let your hairdo grow wild and end out of control. Perhaps your lawn gets pretty long before you get around to cutting it. But then there are other times when neglect has bigger consequences, such as when you have to make it to the airport for your flight, you haven't been checking your, your clock very closely. And even once you're there, you're not really listening, not paying attention to, to them calling out your name on the loudspeakers. And so you don't get to your flight in time. It's a bit bigger of a nuisance. And yet even that is, is not, not so much of a hassle because you can just catch a later flight. But if you ignore such a great salvation, there are no other opportunities that you get. There are deadly consequences at stake for how you live this life. It's the only life that you get. And so may God, by His grace, remind us all of what a great salvation 
he has given us so that we may be a people who pay the much closer attention because of the joy which he has set before us in Jesus Christ. Amen. congregational prayer we will remember our brother Bill Vogelzang who learned this past week that uh, he has a diagnosis of colon cancer and so surgery also will be needed for our brother and so we will remember our brother and, and his wife Ali as well before the Lord in prayer. We will also give thanks for the wedding anniversary of our brother and sister uh, Boltina, that happened yesterday. Good thanks to the Lord for his care over them as well. With these matters in mind, let us go to the Lord and in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ. May we see that he is great and glorious and worthy to be praised. May we see what a great salvation we have in Him. May we live for Him and love Him and day by day seek to draw closer to Him through Bible reading and through prayer so that we may truly delight in Him and prevent us from thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. Forgive us for our self-confidence in thinking that we are standing firm and that we cannot fall. Lord, we know that we are not immune to the neglect and the ignoring of your grace, and so teach us to recognize our need, to trust in you, and to love you, and 
as a church also to grow in our commitment and in our zeal towards you and our zeal for the gospel so that we may always be a people who pay close attention together with our children and our children's children until the day of our Lord's return. Heavenly Father, will you be with our members in special circumstances? We pray for your fatherly care to surround our brother Bill Vogelzang. In light of the diagnosis that he received this past week, we pray that you will sustain him and his wife, Allie, at this time of uncertainty as they prepare for upcoming surgery. Lord, will you graciously grant the restoration of good health, if it be your will. And Lord, will you also grant to Bill and Allie the strength they need to, to trust in you, to rely on your love, and to rest in your preserving power in whatever may transpire. Father, we pray for those who are enduring challenges and struggles of various kinds at this time. We pray for those who are suffering in physical ways, also due to the increase of age. We pray for those who are suffering from painful emotional burdens. We pray for those who are having spiritual struggles. We pray for those who must deal with mental health issues in themselves or in their loved ones. There's also loneliness. There's also deep concerns about families. Uh, and loved ones not walking with you. And there's concern, O oh Lord, for our wider world in the light of many instances of terrible news that we have been hearing recently, many vol volatile situations. Recent tragedies, all the damage that they have caused in this world, cause to many victims and to their families. Lord, our hearts go out to all those who are grieving. And we pray that you will shine the powerfully bright light of the gospel into the darkness of those situations. Lord, we also pray for those who face persecution for the confession of your name. So in so many countries across this world, Father, in the midst of all the uncertainties and the fears and concerns that we may have in life, we pray that you will give us from your holy and inspired and divine word the encouragement and comfort and true hope that we need in times like this and in all times that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ, our faithful Savior. Father, at the same time, we may rejoice in your blessings upon us and towards us. We thank you for the wedding anniversary of our brother and sister Boltina. We thank you, Lord, for bringing them to this point in their married life. That you've given them 64 years together. And though life presents many challenges with growing older and coming with that, the frailties of life, Yet, O oh Lord, we recognize that you are faithful and, and loving towards them. And we give thanks to you for that. And we pray that they may, all, that they may continue to reflect your faithfulness and love toward each other. And we pray that you will continue to bestow your grace upon them. That they may continue to put their trust and hope in you and in your faithful love and care over them. Father, will you continue to grant your blessing to all the members of this congregation, wherever they are, also if they are far off from here on summer travels, be with them and keep them and preserve them and be with us and keep us and preserve us all as we seek to serve you and our neighbor by extending to others the love that you have extended towards us. So will you bless our lives so that they may present a faithful and steadfast witness to this world of the great and glorious things that we have been given by grace in Jesus Christ. Father, will you hear our prayer and our petitions? 
Will you accept our thanksgiving and keep us in your grace? For we ask it all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord now gives you an opportunity to bring your offerings and thankfulness to the Lord, to worship Him by doing so. After the offering has been collected, let us stand and sing together in closing from hymn 83, all the stanzas.
God, the fount of all blessing, now sends us on our way with his blessing. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.